CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with John Warrow of the Associated Press. 716. No Jonah Bronstein today, and that's my fault. I let the week get away from me. I was unable to schedule it. And uh, Jonah is tied up today, so he's unable to uh, to help out. But uh, we have John Warrow to carry the load. No, I, I listened to John's uh, radio show uh, for the first time today. John, that was it was entertaining to listen to. Well, thanks. I've been doing this for almost years, so I've kind of gotten a, the hang of it. Um, it's been a fun little exercise, and, and hopefully we'll have you on one of these days so we can talk music, and um, which I know is something that is big for you as well. Yeah, I'd like that. I'd be honored to be on it. Um, I know that the tricky part is, obviously, choosing the songs is probably takes a, a, a good bit of work and focus because you want it to be just right. But uh, John isn't the regular DJ, as people out there listening should know. Uh, He does uh, talk-ups in between the songs. He explains why it was chosen, and in some cases, he tells a story. Um, How is that part, John, the actual, the writing for a radio show, and to hopefully sound like you're not reading off a script when you're talking into the microphone? Well, that seems to be the thing. It's like, um, fortunately, I'm a trained journalist, so I do write for a living. So that that helps. Picking the songs, putting together a playlist isn't that difficult. It might take me maybe an hour or so just to get it right. It is it is the script that really takes a little bit more time because I, I do have to put some thought into it. I, I do some research into it. And during my research, I actually come up with some interesting things Um like next week's show is going to be about Steve Earle, not realize, and and I I picked a bunch of songs and I picked one by Miranda Lambert called Kerosene, which is a really one of my favorite Miranda Lambert songs, and not realizing that Steve Earle actually co-wrote it, and I found out about that um, in my research, and it's just kind of like how organically these things kind of fall into place, and fortunately I let most of the music I. I the mo- it's it, the show is mostly about music, and I limit myself to maybe talking for maybe ten minutes. So, um, you know, you put you're, you're accustomed to writing maybe eight hundred words, or I think it comes down to maybe eleven hundred characters. So that makes it a little bit more simple because besides all the intros and all and trying to make some jokes and usually they're lame, um, I can get through it uh, maybe in about an hour of of writing. And lest anyone think that this is a sports talk show, uh, I know that we've been talking about music, so people get the gist, but for those who aren't familiar, John's show is on every Saturday at 9 a.m. on WBFO, which is the uh, NPR station that serves both Buffalo and uh, Toronto. And And so... Sorry, but uh, it's it's not on the radio. It's it's streamed WBFO, The Bridge. Oh, uh, my mistake, my mistake. WBFO, the bridge. And so if you're listening to WBFO on the radio at 9 a.m., you hear something else? I think so. I'm pretty sure. You have to you have to get my show through the app from what I understand. How did you listen to it this morning? I listened to it on my phone and with some earbuds. Oh, um, on the, oh okay. But, I, um, but no, I'm, not, I didn't. I'm kind of like Jerry Sullivan when it comes to some things and, and, and dialing nine to get out and all that stuff. So um, I don't know how it works. It just gets out there. And I just, I, I, I try to stay in my own lane on these things. But here's the thing, John, I'm looking at WBFO, the bridge tweet this morning, 
And it says, coming up on the bridge, the John Warrow Show starts at 9 a.m. Here's where to find us. HD Radio, WBFO 88.7 and 94.5. There, oh. And on the app. So I think I maybe have just in, uh, educated you that your show, uh, it does seem based on this uh this ad that it that it's on at 9 a.m and the reason it's the first time that i'm listening it's not because i'm not a supportive friend uh it is because i'm never up at 9 a.m on a saturday for various reasons uh but uh this particular time i was able to listen because i was up working on a story a josh allen story that should be posted at the athletic probably by the time uh you're listening to this it's it's live uh but um yeah, I, I tend to do my best work, whether it be professionally or in my leisure, uh, late at night. Uh, of course, those are uh, subjective. Uh, those are subjective uh, measurements there as to what <laughs> constitutes my best work. But that's usually <laughs> when I when I write. So I pulled an all nighter. I haven't slept since last night, and there it was, nine a.m. The John Waro Show. I was glad I was able to listen. And well, songs you. that I've already downloaded onto playlists that I didn't wasn't aware of, which is one of the beauties of having John Warrow as a friend. You talk music and you learn some things, and uh, it, you um, you widen your perspective on the musical arts. Well, thank you very much, and that's I, that's that's what the show is about. It's about B sides and songs that you may have forgotten or you know, just never heard of, and. That's really what I try to get into. Um, just kind of like find the I mind the mind the mind the cracks of what's between pop and kind of like garage pop and stuff stuff like that. So yeah, thanks for tuning in. The Rolling Stone song I hadn't heard that before. So that is one that's so yeah, popular bands too. Of course, everybody knows yes. the Rolling Stones, but you played a song today that was the forerunner to. Tumbling dice. Tumbling dice. And you could hear it. And I'm listening to it. And I'm thought that. And then sure enough, you come in afterwards and explained it. And I said, aha. Uh, it was good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaking of uh music, uh Taylor Swift uh might be in town tomorrow. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. Let's talk some football. People are tuning sure. into this. We'll give our thoughts on Taylor Swift. John is a unabashed Taylor Swift fan. Um I'm fine with her. I like uh, what I know. Uh, I'm not a huge, I don't know all the the listings. Uh, you know, I don't know what was on what album or what era we're talking about or any of that type of stuff. Uh, but I respect what she does. And it's just interesting to see how uh, Bill's fans seem to think that she's the next Bon Jovi, uh, that people need to be punished for uh, having rooting interests somewhere else uh, as opposed to you know, just thinking, hey, it's pretty cool that she's going to be the game. Anyways, Chiefs versus Bills at Highmark Stadium Sunday afternoon uh, for the right to uh, advance to the AFC championship game. Uh, John, uh, what are your uh, your general thoughts? We'll start there. We'll just go with broad strokes, and then we'll drill down on whatever tickles our fancy. I love this matchup. Um, I, I've loved all the previous matchups. Um, I think this is going to be the game of the weekend. Um, the one, and not just because Taylor Swift's going to be there, but um, I just think... Do we know for sure that she's going to be there? I've heard she's coming. I, okay. I, I heard she's going to be here, and um, that's that's that, that's what we got down the pike. But um, whether she's not or, 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 or is watching from home or wherever she's at, um, I do think that this is going... This is, this is an enthralling matchup between two top caliber quarterbacks and i want to say and i know i i i know there's this thing about lamar jackson but i want to say is like when it comes to there, there's something to watching josh allen versus patrick mahomes and we saw that potential in the 13 seconds game of what those two were capable of doing defenses be damned they were just you know punch after punch after punch that was just one of the most invigorating games I've seen on TV. And I, I, I'm not a Bills fan. I'm not a Chiefs fan. I, I, I'm writing this, but, but it was just a, an enthralling matchup. Um, and I think the two have the potential of bringing it again this weekend, even though there's some good defenses on the field. Um, I'm captivated in seeing how this game comes down. I think the Bills will win. 
a blockbuster heavyweight slugfest. Uh, and you're right. I, I think that Lamar Jackson, clearly elite quarterback, deserves to be in the conversation. Josh Allen's draft class, et cetera, uh, had a nice conversation, uh, or at least I found it amusing, with uh, ESPN's uh, Sports Center anchor Stan Verrett, uh, who I think maybe it bumped his head uh, <laughs> in talking about how about uh, how unfair it is that Lamar Jackson uh, doesn't, uh, you know, must win a Super Bowl, even though he's in his fifth season or whatever. And nobody ever said these types of things about Dan Marino. I was like, what? You know, that was all anybody said about Dan. Anyways, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but Stan and Barrett. We, we sorry, Josh Allen needs to win a Super Bowl for, for him to establish himself too, doesn't he, in, in some senses? Who's he that? get to a Super Bowl. Who? Josh Allen. Oh, for sure. All, yeah. Every quarterback does. It's it's not – I think that there seemed to be this racist overture that, uh, you know, people just don't put the same qualifications on – on uh, some people as they do Lamar Jackson. It's like, it's every quarterback has the same uh, set of qualifications that you need to be considered great. You either need to break a lot of records or you need to be prolific for a long period of time. Like Dan Fouts and Warren moon, the only two quarterbacks in the hall of fame to never play in a super bowl, or you need to have championships or get to the game a lot. There's all kinds of things. Um, But with Mahomes and uh, Josh Allen, To me, it's reminiscent, not quite there yet, of course, but reminiscent of what we um, got to with Tom Brady, Peyton Manning in that. Now, granted, those guys won Super Bowls. They were league MVPs, et cetera, et cetera. But with uh, the Chiefs and the Bills and playing now three out of the last four years in the postseason, you have this belief that even though they're not in the same division, they're going to play each other at least once a year, sometimes twice, because they're always at the top of their divisions. And Lamar right. Jackson just doesn't have that type of out of out of division rivalry yet because the because the AFC North is is just different. Everybody, you know, the Steelers have been good. They the, the Steelers and the Ravens trade off and on. The Browns poke their head up for air every now and then the Bengals get to the Super Bowl. But anyways, with the Chiefs and the Bills, they've had this sustained first place in the division crossover game every year, and that just adds to the sexiness of of this matchup. And um, it, it's uh, it, I I don't think the Bills are going to win this game. Although I've gone back and forth, and here's my caveat: this would be uh, and second reference to Jerry Sullivan on this podcast, (laughs) you would say I'm middling it. Um, My initial prediction that I submit to channel four was the bills uh, uh, to win and win big uh, with a lot of points. And then I did an analysis uh, for the athletic uh, middle of the week and started taking a harder look at the bills injuries. And as we learned that, they might not get certain guys back. Terrell Bernard, uh, he's questionable officially on the injury report, but the guy was taken off on a cart, didn't look good. Um, if he's able to play, uh, who knows what what version of him is out there. He's such an important player on that defense. Balen Spector's out, uh, Taylor Rapp, Christian Benford. Um, it, it, I think that the Chiefs are going to be able to do more with the Bills defense uh, than the Bills are going to be able to do with the Chiefs defense because if you haven't been paying attention to the Chiefs, their defense is really good this year. It is not just Patrick Mahomes is going to outscore every opponent. The the offense has struggled, and the Chiefs have won a lot of games this year because of their defense. And they have some players back um, and a a couple that uh, didn't play against the Bills. So... I just look, I don't know that AJ Klein is going to lead the bills and tackles uh, again, but if he does, that's a bad sign. Yeah. It's a great story. You know, the, the plucky sure. guy off, he thought he was retired, gets called up. He's running the scout team during the week. And by the end of the game, he's got the green dot and he's calling the defensive plays and he gets 11 tackles. That's okay. Maybe against Mason Rudolph and, I forget the Steelers offensive coordinator's name who replaced Matt Canada. Uh, 
I think that Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes are going to be able to figure out ways to deal with whatever's in front of them more so than I think the Bills are going to be able to to do it against the Chiefs. Let me counter. I would uh, love it. That's the whole because, point of this shit. Because, because back in August, if Bills Bills Mafia or we were discussing Terrell Bernard being an, an integral factor and not being in playing in the divisional round against Kansas City and going, oh my gosh, there's no Terrell Bernard. We've learned a lot since then, though. We, no, and, and this is my point. What McDermott has done with his defense, given all the people he's all the talented players he's lost, and this defense still being able to stay afloat. Now I know it sagged in the second half against Pittsburgh, but the important thing is, is Josh Allen got them the lead that they needed to be able to create a one-dimensional opponent. And I think that has been the key to the Bills' second-half surge and what was missing in the first half is their inability to, is the offense's inability to, 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 to build a lead and allow the defense to play its base, essentially, or just focus on the passing attack. I know Kansas City's defense is exceptionally good. I do know that I, th I believe Kansas City is the team entering the playoffs or still alive in the playoffs with the most giveaways this season. I think it's 28. Um, it might even be more than Buffalo. You'd have to check that, but I know it's close. I did some 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 looking yesterday. So I think this game is going to come down. To, I, I think this game is still – you look back, and the defenses were good back in 2021 in the AFC Divisional round, and both teams still combined for 70 – whatever points 78 and i think this has the potential of being that type of game where defenses be damned that that i think allen and mahomes have the potential of taking it over and i do think that the bills despite not having gabe davis um have a more diverse offense than the chiefs do um because you're only counting now on rasheed rice and travis kelsey and sure their running game um but if you can stop if, if you can build a lead against them, then perhaps Isaiah Pacheco doesn't matter as much. Well, Isaiah Pacheco didn't play in that game uh, back on December 10th in Arrowhead yeah. Stadium. Uh, and, and for those... Oh, look at you throwing facts at me. And, and for those who might be wondering, though, hey, Tim, uh, the Bills just beat these guys uh, last month. That's true. The score was 20 to 17. It was not a, you know, barn burner by any stretch. Uh, Pacheco wasn't out there for the Chiefs. They they struggled as they have off and on throughout the year. Um, counterpoint: Gabriel Davis had two targets, no catches uh, against the Chiefs, so they were able to do okay without him. But just a couple of numbers: James Cook, ten carries for fifty-eight yards, five point eight yard average is fine. Uh, in fact, very good. But um, but still, fifty-eight yards. Josh Allen, ten for thirty-two. Josh Allen's stat line when it came to passing, 23 of 42, 233 yards, one touchdown, one interception, uh, sacked three times, and a 68.8 passer rating. Um, that is just not great offensive football. And that is why I think that the defensive aspect of it is going to come to the fore uh, if if Terrell Bernard doesn't play, which I think it, it, he he had, uh, eight, I'm just looking at some stats here. Eight tackles, uh, no splash plays against the Chiefs. Taron Johnson led the Bills with nine tackles. Uh, he had a pass breakup and a fumble recovery. Uh, Taron Johnson is uh, in the concussion protocol. He's listed as questionable. Um, Benford was the fourth leading tackler with five and a forced fumble. Um, so. You know, there are some uh, – Terrell Dodson, uh, he's back, though. Uh, yeah, he's he, back. he had a nice game, too, against the Chiefs. But anyways, it's just these these patches uh, need a lot of spackling uh, for the Bills, and you're right. Uh, Sean McDermott has done a lot, a, a lot of great things with this defense as he's lost players. Uh, let's not forget Matt Milano and Tredavious White. Those were the two automatic names that you used to mention when talking about how good of a job Sean McDermott was doing. And now we don't mention them because there have been so many injuries since. Right. Um, but we did Terrell Bernard and, and let's say on the offensive side, Spencer Brown. 
um, were big unknowns coming into this season. Dare I say question marks? Now I'm not even going to dare it. They were sure, question marks. Right. They were. And they turned out to be fine. But just because Terrell Bernard turned out to be fine, I still am not ready to say whoever's in there isn't going to be a huge drop off because there's just been so much that we've learned about Terrell Bernard. Turns out he's a baller. Um, but if Sean McDermott can win this game with AJ Klein playing a lot of snaps, then we're looking at a masterful, well, barring it be a barring it uh being a 42 to 38 sure. win, you know. But if the Bills can get through this, holy smokes, uh, then you're talking about anything's possible, right? I mean, anything is possible right now, but this is a fan base that just a month ago you couldn't even think about the Super Bowl. And well, now here the Bills are two games away from it, uh, held together with duct tape and bubble gum. I and, and I get that, and I still had this sense back um when they were five and five that this team was still capable of getting to the Super Bowl despite the limitations, despite the flaws. And it was just a matter of trying to find what works. And I I've come to the realization, and I wrote this a couple of weeks ago, that they've they've become a team that embraces its flaws to the point where they're able to overcome them. They can accept them. And this is a team that is, I think, much sturdier than the team that was ent um, entering the playoffs last season, entering the Cincinnati game last season. Um, I don't know if, 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 the Chiefs can punch them in the mouth the way the Bengals did to open the game last year. Uh, and I think this team is grittier for some reason. I, um, And you can see it in Josh Allen's demeanor, the arc of his season, how it's gone. He went from that low-energy, positive stuff to him being the guy that made that 52-yard run. Um, and I think that really encapsulates what we've seen I think that's the arc of the story of the Bills this season as well, to a certain degree, that we're seeing a team that is capable of putting its head down, running through tackles, maybe faking a slide. I'm not sure if he was faking it, but juking an opponent and being able to come out on top at the end. Maybe I'm buying into the Kool-Aid, but I, but, and I know how good Kansas City is. But I just don't know. I've, I've watched enough Kansas City where I question. I like what they did against Miami. That was that was Kansas City Chiefs football. That was a great game, except for the fact that they settled for a lot of field goals. And if that happens against the Bills, that could be a big difference on Sunday. But I just think that there's something, you know, we'll talk about the hunger or whatever. I think there's more hunger in Buffalo right now. And I think that that mythological momentum or whatever that you want to talk about. I, th I think that favors the bills. And I think, and I think being at home that that is going to be somewhat of a factor in which that has the capability of rattling or negating part of what Reed and Mahomes can do on offense. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Patrick Mahomes going with the silent count, all those types of things that the Bills aren't going to have to worry about. The Bills have had success against uh, the the Chiefs in Arrowhead. Oh, that's the one of the big things is that Patrick Mahomes has played one game in Orchard Park, and it was when there weren't any fans because of COVID. And so here he's going to experience uh, Bills Mafia for the first time. They're going to introduce themselves to him probably in very unkind ways. Uh, and he's going to have to deal with that. Um, then again, I mean, the Chiefs have done that on the road before. I mean, whether right. it's the okay. black yeah. hole uh, in Oakland or, you know, wherever. I mean, they always get that. I mean, they get it on the road. It's just that they just not in the playoffs. But, um, yeah, I think it's uh, the home field advantage is is big. Um I think scoring early is going to be big for the Bills also because it's going to uh, be that release yes. from the fans at Highmark Stadium that uh, you know there's always that raring to go but not quite ready yet or not even – they're ready to go but need, they need a reason. Right. They need, they need to get after it. And if the uh, – That place was a funeral home against the Giants in the first half. Right. And um, if if the Chiefs can get out early, then um, that could be that could be different. Um, I had a point I was going to make, and I don't recall what it was exactly. 
My bad. Um, but uh, we'll come back around to it. Uh, I want to throw this out there. I don't even know what my answer is going to be, uh, but uh, I'm sure you've given it some thought. Uh, Von Miller was signed to help the Bills get past the Kansas City Chiefs uh, to get after Patrick Mahomes, uh, who had beaten the Bills in back-to-back postseasons, eliminating them from uh, from the tournament. And so Brandon Bean identified Von Miller as a difference maker, went out and got him. And so now here it is. Uh, Von Miller has been ramping up a little bit, getting a little bit more pressure. How do we write about Von Miller if he makes the big play? Do we just write football? Um, this is a complicated moment, uh, given what he has been um, arrested for. Uh, for assaulting, uh, being accused of uh, assaulting his uh, his pregnant girlfriend, and everything has been kind of quiet since then. We haven't heard any developments from the district attorney as to whether or not there are going to be charges filed. And even if you uh, believe uh, that uh, nothing happened, the Dallas police uh, contend that something absolutely happened. Uh, they have evidence. They have testimony. They have photographic evidence. This is not like Matt Ariza in the civil suit. This was actually investigated by a police department. Uh, he was booked. He had a mug shot. He is out on bail um, or had to bail out or whatever the, the actual <laughs> legal ramification is, is on that. Um, what if he makes, what if he gets a strip sack at the end of the game to, to end it and uh, to, to, to send the bills to the next round? How does it get covered? I think it gets it well, be covered. I, I, I would cover it in the fact that, you know, Von Miller finally stepped up in, in what's been a trouble, a, a troublesome year on and off the field um, and made the biggest play of the season um, in, in, in one of the biggest moments of, of the bill season to get them to the AFC championship game. Not, discounting at some point in the story of what he's gone through off the field. Um, I think you have to take both. You, you, I I generally go right down the middle and 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 I'll present both ish both cases and and make sure to represent what he's gone through, what what the allegations are, what he's gone through in, in regards to his injury and the fact that the bills, you know, what why he was signed and 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 who he is. Um, do we celebrate it? I, I I don't know. I know Bills fans will, and we'll you probably celebrate the win. You celebrate. Yeah, I, I know Bills fans will, might want even want to push it back into the media's face, as a, as, a, as I told you so. But that doesn't preclude the fact that there is a pending case out there. Right. It's a little different, you know. I'm on that uh, columnist slash yes. feature writer bent, and um, the athletic considers the stories that I write off of the game to be columns. Sometimes I do insert my voice in there and write from the first person standpoint. I try to consider them more features. I don't, I don't like the role of the columnist quite frankly, but yeah, I am going to have to come up with, uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to figure out how I would uh, handle that uh, because it's a complicated thing. And um, there's a delicacy to it. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I hope he doesn't make the the big play. Uh, that's not to say I don't. I don't hope that the Bills win. I hope somebody else makes the big play. I, I want you know. I I don't root for the Bills to to win or lose. Uh, but there are a lot of people in my life who are from Western New York. Uh, met my wife here. My kids uh, grow up here, and uh, all my friends and the people that I know. Uh, and I want them to be happy. I want, if they would, you know, I would like for them to enjoy a Super Bowl run. Uh, so yeah. Uh, but I, if it comes down to a strip sack, I hope it's AJ Epinesa or Greg Rousseau. And then I don't have to worry <laughs> about the com conflicting emotions of, uh, of, of writing a story that of, about Von Miller, the hero. That said, if you recall, this is before all the allegations is this was last year, Von Miller did play a critical role in stopping Mahomes on the final drive in their, I want to say the final drive of their win in 2022. Um, he got his hand up or, or something happened. He pressured, he forced, he rushed Mahomes. So there is that, 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 that did happen a year ago, but I, I, it, it's, it'll be interesting to see what, 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 what Von can do. And, and he has, 
seemed to have stepped up his game a little bit. Mind you, he got a you know he he rushed um, Mason, the guy, the Pittsburgh quarterback, Mason Rudolph. There you go, Mason. The guy, with, the guy with a first name for a last name and a last <laughs> name for a first name. Right. He he did get him late. Uh, almost got him late in the end, but uh, of last game, but. Um, I'm just not sure if his leg's there, and 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 I guess we'll see. Let's stay tuned. Let's yeah, see. I don't know that the Steelers were giving it their all in a two-score uh, deficit late in the game with the weather the way it was. Uh, I, I'm sure that there were a lot of Steelers that were already thinking about um, getting home uh, into yeah. their nice warm bed. Um, and I think that that's also what you mentioned, the Bills sagging against the Steelers, the defense, that is, the Bills defense sagging against the Steelers in the second half. And I think that's also indicative of, uh, you know, being up 21 nothing. And with I, I think that, you know, that happens sometimes. Right. You know, there was uh, – they knew they had them. You know, it was a pretty dominant start to the game. The Steelers uh, were able to respond thanks to a blocked field goal, uh, you know, a fluke play. Uh, beyond that, the Steelers uh, really weren't even in the game, and that was the lead to my story. They didn't belong on the field with the Bills uh, I agree. last week. Um, so I interviewed Robbie Takak uh, oh, from the Boo Boo Dolls uh, for yeah. a story about Josh Allen, oh. uh, to which the premise being, um, why doesn't he slide? <laughs> why, why don't you? So Robbie Takak, uh, for those who don't know, is the bassist and co-founder of the Goo Goo Dolls and the song Slide. I love which, the idea. Yes. So um, the, uh, talked with him. He's not a huge sports fan, but he's a Buffalo fan. And so he's very plugged into what the excitement, I think the quote was from him is, uh, I love hysterias. Uh, I and he, he obviously that the, the Bills uh, are doing it right now, and he watches the game with his twelve-year-old daughter, and um, and uh, you'll have to check out the Athletic uh, to find out if Robbie Takak does think that uh, that Josh Allen should slide. Uh, Josh Allen, the runner. Um, it, it really, and we talked about it earlier, but I want to circle back on it, John. Uh, he really does make the defense go. Uh, when he's doing this, as opposed to that more judicious quarterback, the Bills seem to wish they had uh, at right. the start of every season. Go, they go <laughs> through the off season trying to recalibrate this guy's DNA uh, into a executive instead of a swashbuckler, uh, and he doesn't take to it. Uh, it uh, and I think he did it. He gave it an earnest effort this year, and that's what we got. That disconnected uh, yeah. zombie um and finally he re-embraced the don't give a fuck you know i'm going to take a hit i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to drop my shoulder if i have to because i want to not because i feel like i I'll, I'll, i know i don't need to i just want to uh and that attitude uh really does give that offense a totally different uh personality i will say he's been more judicious in the late half of the season in picking his spots picking up that third and 13 was i think a critical moment and when he put his head down you almost knew he was going to be able to do it in miami in miami correct yeah. and that was a big game that was a huge game even though they had already clinched the playoffs spot but just to, to just and that play pretty much ended it it did and then to do the, the 52 yard touchdown run I think that, I mean, that was putting, keeping your foot on the gas, which is something that the Bills failed to do in the first half of the season. Um, or shoot, they couldn't, they couldn't even find the gas pedal at times. Um, and I think this is, he's been a little bit more judicious. Um, um, and I, I think they've, they may be calling fewer running plays for him and allowing him to pick his spots, but I can't really complain, um, or, or criticize Josh Allen for, for doing what he's done when referring to those two, two plays, because they're big splash plays, they're big momentum plays. Um, and I think that's why you have Josh Allen. If, if, if it, why not use some of his swashbuckling ability because that's who he is. And I think if you, it, you rein it in a bit, but I think we're seeing maybe the risk reward Josh Allen that you need to see over the course of a season 
Maybe he doesn't need to do that in 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 you know week three, but with the season on the line in week eighteen or 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 the divisional playoffs or what have you, I think that's when you need to see that type of Josh Allen. Mitch Morse uh, said it uh, perfectly after the uh, win over the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and that was a game in which Josh had was coming off a series of games that looked pretty lethargic, rushing totals in the teens. Yep. Uh, and then I want to say he ran within the first couple plays of the game. It, it was a tone setting type mentality, uh, an aggressive approach at the start of the game. He ended up rushing for 40 some yards and a touchdown. Um, not gaudy by Josh Allen standards at all, but based on what we had seen over the previous, say, five, six games, it was a it was kind of an eyebrow raiser like, hey, there's the spark. That's that's the guy uh, that we're used to seeing around here. And was that the game Morse, he said he's back? I'm sorry. Was that the game he said I'm back? Yeah. Been, but maybe. go ahead. Go, I blew your Mitch Morse quote, but go ahead. No, no, no. That's okay. Uh, but Mitch Morse uh, said he let his freak flag fr- freak right. flag fly a little bit out there, uh, and he said it in such a way that you know it was uh, that even his own teammates were looking for that Josh Allen again. Yep, uh, and. I even said to Josh I, or to uh, Mitch, I said, I, your offense seems to be a lot better when he lets his freak flag fly. And, and uh, Mitch Morris nodded and said, yeah, that's fair. You know, that was, that was week eight. And there were still some Rocky moments after that. Ken Dorsey wouldn't be fired uh, for another couple of weeks, but yep. um, yeah, that was, uh, that was, uh, that was the, a little bit of the spark that I think that we're seeing now he's gotten used to it. He's broken out of whatever constraints management had on him or, you know, the wishes of Terry Pagula and Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott for this guy to uh, preserve himself in bubble wrap and last as many seasons as possible. And Nick Bakai uh, explained it better than anybody uh, when we had him on the podcast a few weeks ago. He he, he said, uh, or no, maybe it was Ryan Nobles from uh, NBC News. Oh, shoot. One, I think it was Ryan Nobles who said, essentially, I would rather have eight years of Josh Allen making getting me uh, as close to the Super Bowl as possible than 15 years of whatever this guy is that we're watching right. at the time. Um right because it's just a, it's just another above average quarterback. Uh you take right, away right. you take right. You take away those, you know, that big sack that the guy's got. And I'm no, big sack isn't there because sack is an actual official. <laughs> you take that that satchel uh that that uh, Josh Allen walks around with uh and uh and you, you neuter him and uh, what's the point? Uh Neither then you don't have Josh Allen anymore. Well, and that's the thing is that, and and we go back to what Brandon Bean has always said when he was identifying quarterbacks, whether or not Josh Allen was his top choice, but eventually he's come to the conclusion and said he does represent Buffalo and, you know, say what you will about this blue collar town. There is some Buffalo quality to him, um, despite all the ads that he's on and all this stuff. Um, you, you, he does come off as a regular guy and a lunch bucket guy, um, who's capable of. Uh, of doing it however he wants and sent going back this was going this was early in the season i can't remember which game it was um but i texted somebody who who's very familiar to us but i'm not going to reveal who it was um and i said uh you know i i go i hope all's well but someone's got to tell josh to be more comfortable in his own skin just like um you were and are not an easy thing to do and I said, whoever's in his ear needs to get out of it. And oh, sorry. And the person replied, no doubt. I don't know who is in his head, but they need to leave. Um, and I think that's, you know, that, that, that was evident in late September or sorry, early October um, when, when all this started crashing down. And I think. Um, and that, that text thought. exchange was none other than you and Bill Belichick. That's really who it was because um, me and Bill are very tight, and um, um, yeah, um, we've been hanging together in his off days these uh, this past week. He's got a lot of free time. He does. 
Where do you think We've he ends up? We've Just been a prediction. Twani. What's that? Just a prediction. Well, where do you think Bill Belichick ends up? The best place for him to end. Well, I know perhaps maybe Jerry Jones is actually scared of uh, 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 of having somebody who's maybe Parcells like again or Jimmy Johnson's like Jimmy Johnson like again in 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 coaching his team um, because the move that he decided to make in, in, in keeping Mike McCarthy, I think was wrong. So, which leaves us to where he's going to land Poor Chan Gailey. He didn't get this longer rope. Like, uh, Correct. Uh, Correct. like, and, uh, Chan, like, um, uh, Jason Garrett and uh, Mike McCarthy have gotten. If I'm a team, I'm looking at three years with Bill Belichick, given his age, so I'm I'm a team that already has a quarterback or at least a, some you know a, a a team in place that can contend, which leads me to believe why he might be angling more towards Atlanta um, than the car wreck that Carolina is, um, because he's got a base. Another place to go to would be the Chargers, but I, I don't think the Chargers ownership mentality actually fits. Though I see they're big on Harbaugh. But I would guess Tennessee's not an option. Carolina's not an option, which leads me to believe that Atlanta would be the place to go. Do we know for sure that Miami's uh, job isn't available? Oof. And the reason I mention that is because as somebody who covered Stephen Ross for a little bit, this is a guy who likes to swing for the fences. He's never happy. Uh, he's never satisfied with what he has. Uh, he was courting Jim Harbaugh when yep. John Har John Harbaugh, Jim Harbaugh. My like, God damn it. I've covered the I NFL those, since yeah. 2007, and I always have a mental block with those guys. When I go to say their name, I always screw it up and think I'm saying the wrong one. Uh, Jim Harbaugh, uh, when he was at Stanford, um, Stephen Ross went and tried to get him. Uh, when Tony Sperano was his head coach and Tony Sperano sat home looking out the window, waiting for the the plane to land back in uh, Fort Lauderdale and wonder if, if Stephen Ross was going to keep him. Uh, and then just recently uh, the Sean Payton uh, right. flirtations that led to major sanctions from the NFL for uh, tampering uh, because he didn't want Mike McDaniel. Well, Mike McDaniel had some great moments this year, but, uh, the loss in the playoffs and the way that their season ended over the last few weeks. I, mean, I don't know that Stephen Ross has has fallen in love with Mike McDaniel over the past year in the set in, where he hadn't been a year right. or two ago when he wanted uh, Sean Payton. So um, if Bill Belichick's out there on the market, who's to say that Mike McDaniel's job is safe? Right. Well, Miami would be great. Uh, it would be a great spot for Belichick um, because most people do retire in South Florida. Um, and <laughs> but they've got the defense. They've got all the talent there. There's no rebuilding, um, which is, I mean, yes, that would be a great spot, which is why I thought Dallas would be a great spot for Bill Belichick and a, a dangerous spot for the rest of the NFL for Bill Belichick to land because finally they'd have a, a coach that has a sense of time management um and vision but and i still believe that bill belichick is 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 a masterful game planner um even though he's got a blind spot i think for offense in some ways especially when it comes to quarterback but those things are in place in miami and to a certain degree in place in atlanta john anything else you want to mention before we wrap this up i appreciate no. you uh joining me on on a saturday well, no problem. Um, I, just, just the whole. I just I, the whole. We we started this thing. Oh, let me bring let me bring one it. other wrinkle into it. Oh boy. Oh, there we. Bill's kicking game. So I, Matt, I know Mad Hawk is uh, in. In case uh, Sam Martin can't punt, uh, and that is also important when it comes to holding for Tyler Bass. But Tyler Bass uh, missed a point blank field goal uh, on Monday against the Steelers. He's had some issues off and on throughout the season. He has not exactly been automatic. He's been good, but uh, your 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 thoughts on the Bills kicking game and and it, whether or not it can make a difference uh, on Sunday? Well, I think not having. I mean, Sam Martin's had his struggles too, but when he's been on top of his game, um, he's been pinning opponents back, and that's been key for 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 a lot of Bills wins. 
Um, I can't remember which game. He's been one of their great, great defenders. He's been one of their best defensive players with the way he has created all these long field uh, situations for the other team. I think so. I I mean, and right. And, 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 and then you, you complicate that with what Tyler Bass has been going through and yeah, he's had his yips. Um, uh, I I don't know where to go there, only because special teams is is, is such a is, is such a weird thing to gauge. I, I would say the advantage of special teams is it goes to Kansas City, but then we see a guy like Deontay Hardy return that touchdown for the the, the punt for a touchdown, and anything anything really can happen. I just, it just for some reason the Bills have I, I get I, I just go back to the Bills finding a way to embrace their flaws and overcome them at the right moment in the second half run where I just, I, for some reason, the hole is greater. The, the, the hole is greater than its parts right now. And I think they can overcome whatever Tyler bat Tyler bash yips might happen with something else. That's how it's kind of happened um, over the past six, seven, eight weeks. Um, so as much as it's a, it's a concern, it's a concern until we see it become a concern on the field on Sunday. All right, John. Thank, I interrupted you. You had some closing which thoughts. Which is me middling it. So, you are. You yeah. are. Well, well, you talked it out. You talked yeah. it out. You left me with no side to take, so I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, you, But I interrupted your closing thoughts. Well, right. I mean, we've got this whole Taylor Swift thing, and like, what the oh, heck? We didn't do it right. Men? I said we were going to talk about Taylor Swift. What the heck is up with, with with men who are so insecure that just can't deal with a, a, a woman being flashed on TV in in rooting a game? Whereas, like they they all seem to be happy with the the, the camera panning to cheerleaders on the sideline. But heaven forbid, an actual well, and I'm not sorry. I don't want to dismiss the cheerleaders, but this is a woman who has gone. 16 years and has built I'll an empire. cheerleaders. I think they're silly. Well, okay, it's, fine. This is a misogynistic. But, I, but, I, but I'm not saying, but, uh, but, but, here, but here's a woman. Leering at these women. Right. Okay. Why are they needed? I think the, the, the right. have you ever heard of a Bills fan that says, man, I really miss those Jills. They made, they made game day so much better. <laughs> nobody, nobody notices anymore. Right. Right. But, but they this, were replaced but, by a drum line. But all these all these men on, on on social media are offended by the fact that the camera's panning to Taylor Swift. Well, let's I, so I don't care. It's like it doesn't bug me. She's a talented woman who happens to be dating a player, and I think it adds to the whole theater of the NFL of it being bigger than life. No one seems to complain when Madonna was at the halftime show. That may have taken away from the game. So did Janet Jackson per se. But oh my gosh, there's a woman on TV, and it's like I I need to watch I need to watch a huddle. The Nancy Armour from USA Today yes. had a great column that posted this morning about women and their qualifications that they need to meet by men random men a lot of times or maybe the men in their lives when they want to be a sports fan uh and we know that it happens with uh women who are in the sports journalism business um you, somebody finds out what they do and within probably five minutes the conversation is uh trivia questions like you need to uh pass this you know pass this test to, to prove that you're that you know your sports men don't ever have to do that right. there's just this understanding among us that we all know our shit but we know plenty of men who know fuck all about sports hell hell stan verrett proved it a couple of nights ago <laughs> regarding dan marino i mean it's like come on dude uh but w women constantly have to prove that they right. deserve to watch and enjoy sports and it is uh it's absurd and it is it's misogyny uh just well, these are the first, sample these are the number first. one billion, uh, three hundred and seventy-eight million, four hundred and eighty-seven thousand, <laughs> one hundred and twelve. And these are the same men who are tweeting at me. Who cares about women's hockey or who cares about women's sports? Why? What's? I'm. If you don't care about it, why just? You know, we're on misogyny. Just move on. It's like I don't care about bowling, but I I mean I'm not watching pro bowling on TV 
And but I'm not tweeting it like, oh my gosh, or, or cricket for that matter. The AP sends out all these cricket international cricket uh, scores and stories. I'm not saying who cares. People. Uh, I wonder if they spend their days like <laughs> emailing or tweeting at HGTV saying, I don't care about this flipping house flipping show. I mean, nobody cares or, right. you know, A and E and, uh, you know, uh, fuck the hoarders, you know, nobody's, nobody needs to see these hoarders. Utah housewives off my TV, right? Change the channel. <laughs> that's, that's really all it is. Amen. Amen. Uh, John, thanks for this. We've solved the world problems. I will see you Sunday if I don't see you sooner. Um, but, uh, regardless, uh, I'll see you Sunday and I'm grateful for this and I'm grateful for everybody out there, uh, for listening, please give us a like comment, subscribe, rate it, uh, whatever your platform offers, uh, please let us know that you're out there and, uh, watching or listening, uh, to Tim Graham and friends brought to you by CTBK CPAs and business consultants. The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions.